Thank you for joining us today at Kindred Church. We are uh, so happy to be here with you. Uh, we're continuing our discussion of knowing Jesus. And as we're getting started, um, there's a story that I came across a while back. Uh, it was based around the end of World War II. Uh, a number of orphan children during the end of that war were living in uh, the ruins of cities and in the countrysides. Uh, and the problem was just getting worse and worse. So the Allied armies gathered up or, and tried to find a safe place for all these kids. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids had to go to uh, encampments until a more permanent solution was found. Um, so these places had, had they had their pro excuse me. These places had their problems, but they were far better than living in the streets and in the countrysides and. And uh, when they were in these encampments, they had shelter, they had warmth, they had clean water, they had relatively uh, wholesome, healthy food. Yet despite their warm beds and their full bellies, they were all still having a hard time sleeping. They seemed uh, very nervous and unsettled. And finally, a British psychologist, after making some observations, came up with an idea that he thought could help uh, these young children. Each child was given a piece of bread to hold on to uh, when they went to bed. This uh, particular piece of bread was just to be held. Uh, it was not supposed to be eaten until the next day when they woke up. And this simple little piece of bread produced pretty wonderful results. The children went to bed knowing instinctively they would have food to eat when they woke up the next day. And that little bit of security gave them the ability to get a good night's rest. That guarantee gave them um, restfulness and contentedness. So what was it that was so special about that little piece of bread? Well, the bread wasn't for their stomachs. Uh, the bread was really for their souls. Uh, their stomachs were already full from all the other food they were eating, but they had a deeper hunger that was going on in their lives, a deeper need that uh, was what these kids were suffering from, and that little piece of bread at dinner or at bedtime helped. And that deeper hunger is something that we all struggle with at one time or another. Uh, that hunger that can't be satisfied by normal needs. And what these kids and what we all are really feeling um, is a need to find security and satisfaction for the soul. And this is precisely what we want to talk about today. Um, our theme for 2023, uh, and as a new church, is uh, this one word, known. Uh, getting to know Jesus on a more personal level is our, our focus during this time. And we're going to be seeking to do this in a variety of ways and through a variety of studies. But we are beginning by looking at what Jesus says about himself. We believe that Jesus wants to be known, and thus... He tells us a lot about himself through a series of what are known as I am statements. And the I am statement that we're looking at today is I, I am the bread of life. And this statement Jesus speaks, um, it, he's really in this moment speaking to that deeper hunger that's inside of all of us. Jesus speaks to a group of people who, these people know what it's like to be physically hungry. But in this particular situation, this crowd of people, they were not um, speaking from a, a place of physical hunger. So Jesus talks to them about the bread that they are in need of. Uh, so let's, let's kind of back up and look at the context of what's going on here. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he had uh, massive crowds that were following all over the countryside. And one late afternoon, when a large crowd had followed him out into really in the middle of nowhere, they listened to him teach for hours and hours beside the Sea of Galilee. And uh, as the day was coming to an end, there was an obvious need for food that was brought to his attention. But like I said, it was getting late, and there was nowhere uh, nearby that they could get enough food to feed potentially you know, 15,000 people. So as they looked at their options, Jesus was offered a, a small boy's lunch. And from that kid's lunch, you know, something, just think of this in context of something the size of a Lunchable, right? 
Jesus miraculously fed somewhere between five and 15,000 people from a Lunchable. Uh, and all these people at the end of this miraculous dinner had full bellies. There was so much uh, at the end of it that they were able to collect baskets and baskets of food. Uh, soon after all this happened, though, is where we come to the dialogue we're going to be talking about today. This group had followed him to the other side of the lake, and John tells us in John 6, 25, they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, if I told you the truth, um, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand these miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that only the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, well, we, we want to perform God's works too, so what should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. So underlying this exchange is a lack of grasping and eternal spiritual reality that transcends the material. And don't get me wrong, uh, they understand the idea of people. These are very religious people. They get the idea of God, but the only way they really understand God is God as the one who provides material or temporal goods. Now, they were all hoping that Jesus was going to be this promised Messiah, the one they've been hoping for for such a long time, but the Messiah they wanted was very different than what Jesus was. They wanted a Messiah that would overthrow their Roman oppressors. They wanted a Messiah that would usher in a new era of prosperity, like what, what they had during the time of David and Solomon. They believed that if Jesus was able to provide this manna from heaven, just as Moses had done for the children of Israel during their time in the wilderness, then that would be a sign that their time had come. Now, why did they believe that? Because the rabbis had been teaching that since the days of the Maccabees, uh, that the Messiah, the promised one, would bring manna from heaven. So the people were uh, challenging Jesus to produce this, this bread of God, the manna, in order to prove that he is the Messiah they've been waiting for. But something far greater is what's at hand here. So Jesus begins to speak through their limited understanding. Uh, he cuts through their short-sightedness. He notes that it was not God, it was not Moses, but God who provided the manna. Uh, more importantly, manna was not the true bread of God. It was only a symbol. He explains that manna gave you physical satisfaction, uh, just as Jesus had provide, provided physical satisfaction for those five to 15,000 people the day before. But the true bread gives total satisfaction. So let's look, let's talk about what that means for us and our lives on a very practical level, okay? Uh, the first thing that we can see about this bread of life is the bread of life provides eternal fulfillment. Jesus declares in uh, verse 49, your forefathers ate the manna in the desert. Yet, they died. So, they ate, and they died. And the same is true with Jesus. Everyone who ate his food, everyone who Jesus healed, still faced the limitations 
of this temporal, physical life. All the feeding and the healing Jesus did was just temporal, but they were also signs that pointed to something that transcends life as we know it. Jesus' words were intended to lift the listeners from their, their barren, from their food-dominated, their temporal existence, and lift them to an acknowledgement of uh, a supreme hunger that can only be, be filled with a very different kind of bread. Um, unfortunately, though, many failed then, and many fail now, to really hear what Jesus is teaching. They fail to understand the, the life-transforming power that's contained in this truth. For example, some of the most dissatisfied people on earth are people who lived in very developed countries. Uh, some of the most dissatisfied people on earth are the people who live in the world's richest nations. As, people, uh, as a people here in America, we have uh, more than enough food to eat. We have comfortable places to live, but we, um, as a culture, are still just not satisfied. We are not content. We don't feel uh, completion of any type because there's a deeper hunger. There's a restlessness, right? There's a restlessness that's in with, within us, which says there has to be more to this life. Uh, there's an early church father, his name was Augustine. He had made an observation that every single person has a God-shaped vacuum or hole in their soul. And I want you to think about that kid's toy uh, where you have to fit the right shape in the right hole. So we all have a hole in our heart, a hole in our soul that is shaped specifically to be filled by God. Now, we attempt to fill that cavity with a number of other things, but only God can fill. Only God can satisfy that void. Communism is an example of how that has failed, right? Sociologists explain, explain that the fall of the Soviet Union began with their replacement of sacred things, talking about religion and faith, with material hope. Communism promised a utopia of material satisfaction for all people. But that promise could never satisfy. Ever since Adam and Eve's removal from the garden, we have lived in an unnatural environment, a world in which we were not designed to live. You see, as human beings, we're designed to enjoy a garden without weeds. We're designed to have relationships without friction and fellowship without distance. But something is wrong, and deep down, we know it. But within our world and within ourselves, and the only way we know how to fix this is through trying to find things to shove in there. But the Bible tells us that the only way to really fix what's wrong is through Jesus Christ. So let's get back to that story. It would be easy for us to judge uh, or ridicule this crowd of people following Jesus for their... Uh, Let's call it nearsightedness. And in their nearsightedness, it's kind of contagious because the truth of Jesus is that uh, is true for us as it was for them. More important than the hunger of the stomach is the hunger of the soul, which is why Jesus explains, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never be hungry and will never be thirsty. But a second thing that we notice about this text is that the bread of life is the person of Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. Now that is a pretty big statement. And just think about what he's saying there. Jesus is claiming to be what we all need in order to have life. Jesus is saying, if you want to have a real life, you have to have me. Now, the life Jesus is talking about is not found in his miracles. It's not found in programming. But real life, the life he's promising, is only found 
in the person of Jesus. Jesus himself is the bread of life. He doesn't give it, he is it. And to have the bread of life, to have that soul hunger we all experience to be satisfied, we must have Jesus. Okay, That is a truth that we all have to understand. But there's some real uh, diversions. There's, there's some real distractions that this world throws our way to keep us from being able to receive that bread of life. Uh, one of those is materialism. And Jesus addresses that in John 6, 26. He says, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Many of the people who follow Jesus at this point, they were looking for a provider of better free handouts and material goods. For them, Jesus was just the latest and the greatest gravy train, so to speak. These people had watched Rome uh, with limited success um, do kind of the same thing. They Rome had instituted a kind of welfare program that they called Bread for Peace. Uh, there were many hungry, jobless, and homeless people. So the government tried to avoid riots by buying them off with goodies and treats. But their plan backfired because the demands of the crowds grew beyond their capacity to provide. And Jesus faced a similar situation, a similar problem. Uh, that's what was illustrated here on that day where he fed all these people with uh, you know, a kid's meal or a Lunchable, and all they wanted is more food. People will come for the food, but many of the temporal, a lot of those things hinder people from really understanding their deeper need. Uh, missionaries talk about this. They say that in the third world countries, they're referred to rice Christians. Uh, these are the people who convert to Christianity when there is food or some other physical benefit. The problem isn't giving hungry people food. The problem is when our desire for material needs is defining our relationship with God rather than our relationship with God defining our desire for material needs. So Jesus told the crowd, don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Rather, spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. So materialism. Materialism is one of the things that distracts us from Jesus, but there's others, uh, like legalism, okay? Legalism or religiosity. Uh, in verse 28, we're told, they asked Jesus, what must we do to do the work of God? What must we do to do the works that God requires? Um, notice that emphasis of do. In fact, it's a double do. You could say it's do-do. I should probably stop there. But some people refer or prefer to do some kind of task, right? Rather than having a relationship with the sovereign God, they rather have something that they are able to physically do. They wanted a job. These people wanted an assignment that would give them some sense of sovereignty. So to these, this whole Christian thing becomes an agreement or an arrangement. If I do some task for God, then I will get some kind of reward. The problem is, it is easier to make rules than it is to build relationships. The legalist, the religious, wants to know what they must do. They will choose program over person. They will choose religion over relationship every single time. But this is not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants relationships. So when the crowd demanded a list of works, what must we do? Jesus gave this surprising answer in verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Jesus wants genuine loving relationships with each and every one of us. But that kind of relationship can't be bought with 
goods and services. Uh, that kind of relationship can't be bought, and it can't be built on rules and regulations and religion. So materialism, legalism, and there's one more ism that is a real distraction, and that is sensationalism. Sensationalism. Verse 30, these people ask Jesus this absurd question, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? So the legalist wants to know, what do I have to do? The sensationalist, they want to know, what are you going to do to prove who you really are? And think about that for a second. Jesus had just fed thousands of people with two fish and five small uh, cakes. But the very next day, they're asking him for another sign. Obviously, the miracle of feeding thousands gave them enough faith to walk to the other side of the lake to find Jesus. But yesterday's miracle wasn't enough to last. And oftentimes, there is a tendency to want a pep rally more than a personal relationship. Uh, Pastor Billy Graham once said, keep them wowed and you'll keep them around. But in the end, the, but in the end, it will only be the sensation being sought and not the Savior. And there are countless people who want new, exciting experiences, but no sensation ever truly satisfied. God and God alone is the all-satisfying one. Jesus is the bread of life. And what he is declaring cannot be received if we are bound in materialism or legalism or sensationalism. He has come not with some material thing that we can simply have, nor with some task that we can accomplish, or with some experience that we can be impressed by. He doesn't come with anything else because Jesus is life. And as such, he speaks of receiving him in verse 57. Anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. So with keeping all that in mind, I want us to talk about a quote from C.S. Lewis as we wrap things up here today. Uh, he writes in Mere Christianity, Whatever you may think Christianity is about, Set it aside and hear this. Christianity is all about eternal life surging through us. So I want us to talk about that just as we're wrapping things up in light of Jesus saying that he is the bread of life. Um, you and I and every other person on this planet, past, present, future, we were all designed to be eternal beings. And we were meant to live our eternal lives in perfect harmony with God. Now, the physical side of our eternity was ruined by sin, but we still have eternity in our hearts. We still have eternity in our souls. And thus, the Christian life is ultimately a reawakening of that Christian life, of that eternal life that was lying dormant. When we begin to believe, God blesses us with the Holy Spirit. But just like physical bodies, our spiritual, eternal um, being needs to be fed. And Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the fuel that feeds our eternal lives. The living bread came down from heaven. It is a gift from God to you. But consuming this bread... By consuming that fuel that your body needs, your eternal body needs, it's 100% your responsibility. God can give the gift, but you have to receive it and consume it. And today can be the day where everything changes. Let Jesus satisfy that hunger deep within your soul. 
and it can all start today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon.